Thank you very much. And it's a great honor to be here. I came straight from the airport. I don't know if anyone else got delayed for 28 hours in Washington, DC, but that's what happened to me. <laughs> this is what I was wearing on the airplane, so hopefully I don't smell. Um, anyway, um, just the following uh, grant disclosures. And I come from you, I come to you, I'm also sleep deprived, uh, from uh, Tampa, Florida. And does anybody know who this is? Not Flipper. Come on, the, the second movie just came out. Is there anything odd about this particular animal, specifically around here? It's wearing an orthotic tail. So this is winter. And if you want to come and visit me in Florida, winter is at our venue. And I'm sorry, but this clicker is not being too reactive there. So this is winter here, so I don't have time to go into the story. But it's a, it's a great movie, and it's a plug to come to Tampa. Um, so in this brief presentation, and I will have to move rather quickly because I have a lot of information, um, I'd like to present to you guys and share a uh, standardized 15-minute protocol that we use as well as share with you some free downloadable resources that we have made uh, to help PALS or people with ALS um, learn about safe swallowing and kind of navigate the very overwhelming world of AAC devices. Um, so just a little bit to begin with about bulbar dysfunction and ALS. And as we all know in here, ALS uh, is due to the degeneration of both the upper and lower motor neurons. And this gives rise to the following supranuclear symptoms, uh, overall spasticity, muscle stiffness, slowness, hyperreflexia, hyperfunction. And at the same time, a bulbar palsy, atrophy, flaccid paresis, decreased strength, force, fasciculations, and velopharyngeal incompetence. And so we think about ALS speech, um, you know, ALS patients will present with a mixed flaccid spastic dysarthria eventually. But in the beginning, the predominant uh, degeneration um, will kind of give you a, a telltale sign that the speech will sound either spastic or flaccid. And here's an example of an individual with a spastic dysarthria with ALS. And then those that present more predominantly with low motor neuron involvement and, and more of a flaccid dysarthria might sound like this. This bullet made you more like a plane because of this in your neck. And then what about swallowing or dysphagia in ALS? Um, well, we know that it's highly pre prevalent in individuals with ALS. You'll note in this individual here, this is a video fluoroscopic exam, they're aspirating here. Um, into the trachea, there's a delayed weak cough reflex that's ineffective to expel the aspirant material. We have um, another classic ALS patient here, and in the context of diminished uh, resources, you see here that there's this really prolonged um, oral transit time. This patient has um, a, a graham cracker with some pudding, and instead of this moving kind of in an anterior posterior fashion, it's just sort of going up and down, up and down. And I don't have time to keep playing this, but you can imagine um, in the face of reduced uh, resources, eating becomes very tiring and fatiguing for these individuals. And then a, a final example here, this is a patient that said they had no problem swallowing pills. This is actually a, a pill right here. And we are kind of putting them to the test here, and you'll see that having a little bit of problem getting it out of the oral cavity there. And then you'll note with a subsequent swallow, there's some frank aspiration of the liquid um, and a lot of retention here in, in the pockets and the throat, the volecular and the piriforms. Um, so what about airway protection profiles in ALS? Um, so at our center, um, we, we run a lot of different clinical trials. And as part of that, we do a modified barium swallow study. And in these individuals, uh, so far we've got an N of 80. 55% of these patients um, have been able to adequately protect their airways during swallowing. 15% of these patients will penetrate, meaning that material will enter at or above the level of the vocal folds. And the remaining 35% of these individuals will aspirate where material will enter the trachea. So what about those that do aspirate? And I sort of alluded to this earlier, but surprisingly, 58% of these individuals have no cough reflex to aspirate material. 
38% do cough, but it's ineffective to uh, expel the aspirant material, and only 4% have an effective cough reflex. And so this has really caused us to want to look at physiologic-based treatments or management strategies to help with this uh, profound issue. So here's an example of a patient coughing. Okay, George, can you cough for me like there's something stuck in your throat? And we've had some formatting issues here. He doesn't look like that in real life, but um, <laughs> I use a Mac and we have been struggling with some formatting. Dr. Harris, just go ahead and give me three strong coughs into your arm. <laughs> And so you can imagine if these individuals are aspirating, which both of them do, how effective they'll be at protecting their airway. Here's just a, a video vignette that I've prepared that hopefully will play to show you the full spectrum of individuals with different degrees of uh, airway protection. We'll start with two ALS patients that have adequate or normal airway protection during swallowing. <coughs> Good, okay. Now. And now this is a patient who penetrates to the level above Fast. the vocal folds. <coughs> Good. <coughs> now we're going to move down the spectrum to a penetrator to the level of the true Fast. vocal folds. Good. Uh, an aspirator. And I think that video is not going to play, but we'll move on. And now a silent aspirator. Good. Now cough hard like you have some in your so hopefully you can appreciate there the, the perceptual differences and dystocia or disordered cough in ALS, if you think about it, um, due to the spasticity from upper motor neuron degeneration leads to hyperventilation, decreased lung compliance and capacities, and concomitantly the atrophy and lower motor neuron involvement can lead to uh, decreased intrathoracic pressures decreased chest wall expansion, which is important for inspiration, and decreased elastic recall forces, which is very important for expiration. Um, so we've done some work at the University of South Florida where we've compared objective measures of voluntary cough spirometry in ALS patients who have safe airway protection during swallowing versus those that have unsafe or aspirate during swallowing. And uh, I don't have time to go into all the details here, but you can kind of see here that there are differences here. This is the compression phase duration uh, highlighted here in red, which is time to glottic closure during the ballistic movement of cough, as well as peak expiratory forces. And when we've done the analysis, we note that individuals with ALS who penetrate or aspirate have half the cough volume acceleration levels as those who do not. And there's actually a poster that we're presenting at the main conference if anyone's interested in further information on this. Um, I, we've also uh, done some clinical trials looking at the impact of expiratory muscle strength training, and this is the device that we use at our clinic. We have a, two posters actually on this at the main conference as well. This was from uh, 15 patients where we had a five-week lead-in period and a five-week pilot study, and we noted significant improvements in maximum expiratory pressure. And we also noted a significant improvement in cough volume acceleration. And although we didn't notice any group differences in airway protection in two individuals who penetrated uh, or aspirated prior to EMST, um, they did not following EMST. So for these two individuals, this was clinically significant. We're now conducting an NIH randomized sham control trial. We've recruited 36 patients. This is interim data on 28. And thus far, we are seeing in our active group about a 36% improvement in our primary outcome variable uh, versus a 6% improvement in our sham group. This is an interesting uh, patient who was randomized to the sham group, did eight weeks of, uh, of training. Then he crossed over into the EMST group, and you'll note that his uh, MEPS went up quite dramatically. He was really bummed out when um, our home therapist, who is here today, Michelle Rosado, did a three-month follow-up that he had dropped down to 85, but we tried to tell him this is a seven-month period, and he's still double what he was at the beginning of the trial. This is not typical, but this was quite a remarkable uh, individual case. So we do have some posters on that at the main conference. So quickly, in our multidisciplinary clinic, this is all of us at Neal's, which I, we bumped into some of the um, Harvard crew that are here from that. 
um, in Clearwater, and so in our multidisciplinary clinic, it's a one-stop shop. There are eight different disciplines. Patients come in for about a three and a half hour appointment. It's patient-centered. They sit in one room and we rotate in and out. Um, we do a team conferencing or rounding at lunchtime and almost at dinner time at the end. Um, and we only have 15 minute time slots each. We see 20 patients a day. Um, it's fast paced, proactive, dedicated. But it does present quite a bit of a problem. Um, we do know um, from research that these multidisciplinary clinics are impactful on survival in individuals with ALS. But as a therapist, having 15 minutes to screen for speech and swallowing is a very arduous task. And so we need a screen to be easy to administer and time efficient, accurate, uh, valid, reliable, and also to utilize validated tools, to have high sensitivity and specificity, to also answer the question, is further evaluation needed? As well as to have time to uh, do adequate patient education so we've developed a screening tool. It's definitely a work in progress. It's not perfect. Um, and as well as some patient educational booklets to kind of help attack this problem. Uh, this is sort of what it looks like here. It's just one page. We have a speech and voice section and a swallowing section. But it utilizes a number of uh, validated, validated and standardized tools, of which I'll go over very briefly now. So for speech and voice, we do um, a subjective assessment of speech intelligibility. We also use the ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing Association uh, NOM scale. We use a patient report of communicative effectiveness that's been validated, as well as the speech intelligibility test. We also do education on effective communication strategies, voice banking, um, and AAC, and we have patient handouts for this, um, as well as referral to voice banking clinics or an AAC evaluation. Um, so this is what the ASHA NOMS uh, speech scale looks like, and I'm happy to talk with people after this about this, and this is what the, the voice one looks like. Um, this is the Communicative Effectiveness Survey um, published by uh, Neil O'Donovan in 2007. A patient essentially can have a score ranging from 8 to 32, and it assesses their perceived ability to communicate effectively across a variety of different uh, environments. Um, we have uh, developed these guides, which are free to download. This is the website, uh, the lab website you can download this from. And I'd welcome any feedback. And it's about a 12-page pamphlet that we use that's um, current in the United States. And we've also developed an AAC comparison chart for PALS that uh, compares different modalities. So moving on to swallowing really quickly, we do the Yale Swallow Protocol. Um, the functional oral intake scale, the eating assessment tool, and the ASHA uh, national outcome measurements. Um, so the Yale Swallow Protocol, got my two minute warning there. This was um, uh, done in a five and a half thousand individuals, not with ALS, but with dysphagia. Um, it's where a patient is given three ounces of water, they're uh, asked to sit upright, and they're instructed to drink the entire three ounces of water from a cup or with a straw, if that's how they typically drink, sequentially without stopping. It's a binary outcome measure. They pass if they successfully do this uninterrupted um, without any overt signs or symptoms of aspiration, and they fail if they're unable to complete, if they throat clear or cough within a minute afterwards. Here is an example, Oop, here is an example of a patient. I'll go back one. And this is an example of a patient passing the exam. Great. And you would wait one minute after that. So I'm just going to wrap up here. This is the functional oral intake scale, and I'm happy to provide information on this later. This is the eating assessment tool. This was validated. It's a um, patient self-report of swallowing severity. We have done a study in 50 individuals with ALS to note that those that actually aspirate with ALS report on average three times higher EAT-10 scores. So we do think that this is a very useful tool, and I'm just going to, in the interest of time, not show you all of that, because my fellow Australian is going to kick me off here. Um, this is the ASHA norms, and then these are our safe swallowing guidelines for PALS, again, freely downloadable. And that is it. Sorry I had to rush. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I just wonder how many of us swallowed when the uh, video fluoroscopy was on the screen. <laughs> I certainly somehow, for some reason, always do. Usually someone coughs when I show the cough stuff. Oh, no, I didn't cough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Amber Ward from North Carolina in the US. Um, is your screening tool um, available as are the pamphlets? No, we haven't made it available on it, to be honest with you. We just kind of, it's what we came up with. And um, we're not saying that it's the best thing ever um, or that anyone else should use it, but that's what we use. And um, it's the, you know, I took over this ALS clinic about a year ago. And to be completely honest with you, it was, they weren't really doing anything at all. And so I just tried to come together with what I know are, you know, validated tools that are sensitive and specific. And that really give you the most bang for your buck. I will say the three ounce water swallow test is great if it's indicated for a patient. Obviously in some of our patients, you're not gonna give them three ounces of water to, to chug. <laughs> um, but the eating assessment tool is great. Patients can fill that out. It can be sent out in their home packets. And we have found that it can differentiate um, aspirators versus non-aspirators. We've also had caregivers use this, which might be interesting for telemedicine, particularly in rural populations. And caregiver and ALS patients highly, highly correlated, um, and caregivers can also differentiate aspirators versus non-aspirators, so I'd highly recommend that. But if you want to shoot me an email, I'd be more than happy to send you our protocol and just give me feedback of what you think. Other questions? They're all swallowing well. <laughs> oh. Yep. If you have a question, put your hand up and hold it up. <laughs> Hi, it's Philippa from Edinburgh. Um, I was just wondering about your clinic and how often, I'm, I'm going to miss this bit, at what point do you do kind of your initial assessment and how often do you review and do you do all of the assessments every time? Yeah, so um, our patients come in typically um, every three months unless they're extremely slowly progressing or fast progressing and that may be altered, but I would say 90 to 95% of them come in every three months. And I do this evaluation on all of them every single time they come in. It seems like a lot, but we have it down to an art. The, the functional oral intake scale, the um, EAT-10, we send that out in their home packets so they come in with that filled out. The three ounce swallow test takes like a minute to administer um, and uh, you know, the norms and all of that you're filling out while you're kind of talking to them. We actually find the patient education to be the diff most difficult part, and that's why we developed those uh, brochures to at least help with that. One last question. No? Well, thank you to uh, thank you. Emily for that presentation, and thank sorry you. you had to spend so long at the DCE.